I am uh, Filippo, and I've been maintaining the Go Cryptography standard library since uh, 2018. Uh, I started uh, doing that uh, while working at Google and worked over the years on it with Katie Hockman, uh, which unfortunately couldn't uh, come today, uh, and uh, Roland uh, Schumacher, Damian Neal, uh, and others. Uh, now I'm an independent open source maintainer, and I still maintain the, uh, I'm still a maintainer of the cryptography packages, and uh, I do that as uh, independent uh, with uh, contracts with various clients, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit in the conclusion. So, what is the cryptography standard library? Well, when you uh, get Go, you also get a whole set of libraries and packages to help you uh, build applications. Uh, it's a tool to build secure applications. So the cryptography uh, packages are all the implementations of things like hashing and encryption and um, signatures, and as well as the higher level protocols like TLS and SSH. In other languages, you have to bring in uh, external toolkit. Most languages end up using OpenSSL or uh, uh, or some derivatives, while well, Go made the decision early on, before my time, uh, to re-implement all of it in Go. And that turned out to give uh, Go a significant advantage both in terms of cross-compilation and in terms of security because it allows us to keep the scope very focused and do all the work you're going to hear about today without a lot of the legacy and uh, compatibility requirements of using a cross-language toolkit. Now, on that list, there was one of the major uh, news of the last uh, couple years of cryptography development. And I'm going to tell you about things that happened uh, between Go 118 and 98 minutes ago, when I convinced Roland to merge one thing that I want to tell you about. <laughs> Uh, the crypto ECDH package uh, is a, a whole new uh, top level package that uh, we introduced to address one of the most uh, annoying APIs and um, uh, easier to, uh, to misuse APIs in the standard library. That was the crypto elliptic API. The crypto elliptic API uh, was one of the uh, oldest ones we had, and it was uh, the API you would use to do f uh, things like elliptic curve Diffie Hellman from uh, their ECDH and other low level operations on elliptic curves, which are a way to do asymmetric encryption. Now, What's bad with that API? That's the old uh, crypto API. Well, that API exposes something that's below the abstraction, uh, to riff on Alan's talk, uh, of what is an elliptic curve point. Who knows what an elliptic curve point is? Good, no one, correct, it's my job, shouldn't be yours. <laughs> and that API makes it your job, because now you have to care about what's X, what's Y, what happens when X doesn't match Y, what happens when X is negative, what happens when X is overflows the field size, what even is a field size, and what happens when you just take random values and put them in there. The answer to all of these questions is in the CVE database. <laughs> because each of these led to various vulnerabilities when we realized, well, I guess people could do that. Hmm. Well, uh, so issue after issue after issue, we went and deprecated that and replaced, uh, not to talk about the fact that begint is not constant time, which we'll get to. And so we went and we replaced it with this API. As this is the crypto ECDH API, and it's very different. It doesn't talk about X and Y and K and any of that. Instead, what you have is a private key and a public key, a way to deserialize that from bytes, because you're implementing a protocol, so you're gonna get a public key coming from a JSON file or from a TLS uh, packet or something like that, and you get a, a type which is opaque. It's a public key. We're not telling you anything more than that. And you can smash together a, a pr private key and a public key to get a secret out, which is what ECDH is for. The important thing is that this gives very limited leeway for uh, applications to do weird things that we would find surprising and somebody would find probably vulnerabilities. So this this byte-based API is both more efficient because it allows us to uh, hide a lot of optimizations behind the uh, curtain and safer and easier to use. And I'm very happy about, uh, about this and has been a long time coming. One important thing here has been to realize that the, the thing that 
everybody was using that low-level package, Cryptolytic 4, was mostly ECDH. So we, did, we took a step back and we said, OK, so if everybody is using this for ECDH, we shouldn't have a low-level elliptic curve uh, library. We should have an ECDH library. And then if anybody does something lower level than that, they can use a third-party module. One uh, thing I really like about it is that it's also uh, designed so that if you use one curve, it's not going to bring in the code for the other curves, which both makes binary smaller, and it makes govon check happier, because if there's a vulnerability in one curve but you're not using it, it's not getting comp compiled, and so govon check is not going to tell you that you have a vulnerability when actually you don't because you're not using that curve. And uh, there's a fancy static analysis test that actually checks that uh, that's, uh, that's true and basically b builds a binary using only one curve and checks that the other curves don't show up in the binary and I'm very happy about it and that's, that's a real QR code and can we talk about how cute that is for a second please? <laughs> Uh, this is um, produced with uh, Russ Cox uh, QR art um, tool. Cool. So what powers the new crypto ECDH package? It's built with generics on top of the internal NIST EC uh, package. That's an internal package. That's a low-level thing that is only for us to do. But even that has a much safer API than the old one. Because we are also humans, and we also have a complexity budget and an ability to get things right and not get things right. So it's important to make uh, safe APIs for ourselves, too. And NISTC is different. Well, ah, such a big screen. Uh, and NISTC has, again, a safe, opaque API that just deals with byte slices everywhere. It uh, uses uh, code generated from the Fiat Crypto project, which you can't Google because I, can you imagine what happens if you Google Fiat Crypto? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, but it's a um, project from MIT that predates cryptocurrencies uh, and that um, produces formally verified arithmetic uh, so that all those uh, carry uh, uh, bugs that kept uh, getting into implementations all over the place, all over, like in all implementations, all languages, uh, can't happen because there's a formal proof of the correctness of the algorithm. It uses a complete addition formulas because to do things on elliptic curves, you need formulas. And some of those formulas have an asterisk that say, oh, this works unless the two inputs you give it, this is an addition formula, but it doesn't work if the two inputs are the same. Can you imagine having a process to add two numbers that breaks if you pass three plus three? Yes, that was truly a, a <clears throat> anyway, uh, that was the past where we now have safer formulas. They are 5% slower, 10% slower. That's a, a cost that we're willing to pay because it allows us to be much more confident in what we're producing and even optimize it more if necessary. And it's all constant time, as I mentioned. So what was the overarching goal here? This is part of a large project to move math big uh, which is a library to operate on very large integers out of the security perimeter. MathBig has been in the standard library forever and was used to bootstrap a lot of the cryptography libraries. And that served its purpose. But the problem with it is that it's made for so many different things. It's not a cryptographic library. It's a library for doing many different things amongst them cryptography. That never works. Just, just never works. Doing many things amongst them cryptography you know it's not going to work from there. Uh, and the, so what, what we did is <clears throat> we succeeded. And this is possibly the three lines I was happiest to put in a, a release note in my entire career. I'll give you a second to read them. That's how proud of them I am. So what happened is that we moved everything that deals with attacker control data, everything that pro processes things that might come from somebody who wants to cause issues in the program, and moved it to new implementations that are much simpler and much easier to uh, manage, and stopped using MathBig, which was both variable time, so had side channel issues, uh, and had so much code. And that required uh, moving three main things. One is cryptoelliptic, and we just talked about how that moved to crypto ECDH and NISTC. Then crypto ECDSA, uh, and that was just a boring, complete rewrite of the whole thing uh, that had to replace um, uh, everything with the new NISTC package. And some of the scariest code I've ever touched is in crypto ECDSA, because crypto ECDSA, ECDSA is a 
poorly specified standard that if you have a little bit of bias when you select a random number between zero and a very specific number, uh, just blows up, just gives away the private key. Like you make a signature and with that signature you can recover the private key. I, uh, people, the, the, um, Swift on Security once said that cryptography is math that cares what pen you use. <laughs> yep. So that's, that's the most scary code. And now it's a nice rejection sampling loop that uses high level APIs from NISTC, has testing hooks so that I can make sure that I'm actually hitting the things I'm, uh, I think I'm hitting. Um, but one thing that did is change the algorithm of generate key. And of course, there was someone who was uh, relying on that, the fact that always the same key would be generated given the same randomness. So now there's some code in there that just randomly reads a byte or not, just to tell you don't do that. Um, if you're curious, uh, search the code for a maybe read byte, which my one of my favorite um, uh, function names. Maybe read a byte, maybe not, I don't care. <laughs> Okay, so that got us uh, ECDSA. The uh, last one was RSA. RSA is the trickiest one because it needs to do these large uh, integer uh, operations over fields that uh, are not known in advance. Whatever. Uh, just needs to deal with very large numbers that are not known in advance. So for that, uh, we introduced a whole new uh, internal package, big mod, which is for big um, uh, integers modulo uh, 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 another number. And it's very different from MathBig. It was originally contributed from Lucas Myers and basically were written uh, over a couple uh, releases to, uh, to make it faster and to make it less complex. We got it down to 400 lines of actual code and I'm so happy about that. Um, and it's all constant time and it's even a little faster. Now, it's a little faster because a lot of things went, uh, went into it. Uh, there was bounce check uh, elimination where you just uh, convince the compiler that it doesn't have to check if you've gone over the end of the slice at every iteration. Um, there was um, a bunch of pre-computation. Uh, we reused some of the assembly, uh, one of the assembly cores from MathBig. It, MathBig had a lot of assembly. We uh, moved it uh, down to a single core. And uh, one of my favorite things, the stack preallocation. I'm going to show you how that works. But the final result was that we made things between 15 and 70 percent uh, slower in Go120. Didn't actually realize it was 70, but apparently AMD processors were just way slower on it. Don't ask me why. I don't know why. It's now faster. Uh, so now we got all of that back and then some. It's faster than when we started, constant time, much shorter, uh, and much more maintainable. So happy about that. Of course, None of this is just my work. Uh, Roland reviewed uh, most of the stuff I did. Lucas con uh, contributed uh, some of that, and I'm sure I'm forgetting uh, some of it. This is a team effort. So this is the pre-allocation. Uh, turns out that if you don't know exactly how much you're going to have to allocate, this is a good trick. You allocate a zero length slice with a constant capacity, and you do it in a function that inlines into the caller. And then you use that. And as long as you don't leak that to the heap, you can keep that allocation on the stack without changing the semantics of your program at all. Because if you do go over, by, for example, by doing an append past the pre-allocated uh, size, it will just move to the heap. So it will get a little slower, but it will not break. And there is no way to mistakenly rely on the size of the pre-allocation because the actual length is zero. You still have to do the correct appends. So I was very happy about that. that squeezed about 5% performance out, which allowed me to then go and delete a whole function that was making things faster, but much more complex. Like, I, I really like, ah, I made a thing faster. You are going out. And it, yeah, I don't understand the function. It's gone now. Cool. But I did say a bad word earlier. I said assembly. Go, go is memory safe. Go is nice. Go is readable. Assembly is none of those things. <laughs> But we do need some assembly cores sometimes uh, to make some of the hot loops uh, go, um, uh, have the performance we want. Now, we, did, uh, we embarked on a uh, quest of risk mitigation for the assembly in the cryptography standard libraries. And there's a whole policy uh, that, that I invite you um, to read uh, and if you have feedback on. The, uh, a lot of it, we. <coughs> 
we now generate with a higher level uh, program, which is AVO by uh, McLaughlin, uh, which is basically just a library to produce assembly that takes care of things like register allocation and allows you to call your function, I don't know, add uint124, uh, uint uh, yeah. add uint128, uh, and not, I guess, just copy pasting the same lines of assembly many times in the same file, which is how you're supposed to do it otherwise. Uh, so we're very much a fan of um, AVO. Also, uh, we uh, worked to get the same API across uh, all of the assembly on different platforms so that we uh, have a predictable uh, interface with the assembly and can test it uh, consistently. And finally, we focused our efforts on the assembly for ARM64 and AMD64 uh, and left uh, the rest to be maintained by um, teams that, uh, external uh, teams that care about each specific architecture. And also just drop the 32-bit ones because if you want fast, 64-bit. If 32-bit is compatibility target. But really, the main uh, risk mitigation strategy for assembly is to have less assembly. Uh, one thing I haven't talked about is we also did a rewrite of the 25519 libraries. And as part of that, we removed, I think, 1,770 lines of manually written assembly. And that made AMD64 40% slower and ARM64 40% faster. Don't ask. Uh, and nobody complained. So it turns out we didn't need all that assembly that was un uh, unreviewable and very hard to maintain and could have hidden, vul hidden vulnerabilities. So that was all about very low level things. We talked about elliptic curves, even assembly. Uh, let's uh, move a little bit uh, higher up uh, and let's uh, talk about TLS. TLS is the protocol that is the thing that you're most likely to encounter directly. All these things you do use probably as part of some other package, but you're most likely to interact with TLS. Uh, TLS had um, a few major news. One is that TLS 1.0 and 1.1 are now disabled by default on the client side. And I hope this is news to most of you, because if it's news, it means it didn't break you. Yes? I broke. You, you broke? All right, you know, uh, I, I'm willing to take that cost. <laughs> I'll send you the page. <laughs> oh, I mean, uh, I, I do, in fact, have notifications enabled for the crypto channel on the Gopher Slack, which is possibly the worst thing I've ever said in public. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, <clears throat> But that's, uh, that's progress. Uh, over the years, I'm hoping we'll turn it off by default for servers too, and eventually maybe even remove the code. That would be nice. But t things take time. Then, Cypher Suite ordering. Uh, do you have opinions about Cypher Suites? Do you think that TLS ECDH ERRSA with AES 128CBC SHA is better than TLS RSA with AES 256 GCM SHA 384? Which one is better, the first or the second? Uh, raise your hand. The first one? Sure, I don't want to care. OK, very few uh, hands. The second one? You're wrong. <laughs> You're wrong. The first one is way better. It has much more security properties because it has forward secrecy. Do you care about any of this? No. So we're just taking care of that now. You just turn them both on, and we just use the better one. And even if you put the wrong one first, we'll just pick the better one, because that's our job, <laughs> not yours. <laughs> so you can still turn them on and off, but the order doesn't matter anymore. Uh, and this was extremely useful for us, too, because it allows us to keep supporting certain ciphers that are maybe not particularly secure, but because we know that we'll always pick them as a last resort so that we don't have to worry, what if the application sets it as a preference, though it's misconfigured, they'll shoot themselves in the foot, so maybe we should remove it for safety. Like, no, we're sure that if we, it will only happen if it's the only way. Um, 
then the uh, certificate, uh, certificates that you get from the server are now cached, so that if you connect to many things that have the same certificates or use the same routes, things are much faster, use much less memory. And I put it in, in there because it has a very nice um, cache the, uh, design that uses set finalizer, which not a thing you should use lightly, but this might be the safest use of set finalizer I've ever seen. So. Uh, I wrote an article about it, but the whole design was by uh, Roland Schumacher and Russ Cox. I invite you to um, check it out. That's a QR code. It works. Okay, so, oh, and finally, hasn't landed yet. Uh, well, has landed, but uh, is going to be in the upcoming Go 121 release. There are now APIs to uh, enable quick implementations to, um, to be built on top of Crypto TLS. That doesn't mean that Crypto TLS supports quick itself. But that means that ex both external and uh, potentially upcoming implementations of uh, Quick can use Crypto TLS uh, to implement the cryptography without having to fork Crypto TLS or uh, to use unsafe tricks. Uh, this means that if you've ever upgraded Go and Quick Go stopped compiling, that's fixed now. Okay, so. <clears throat> Finally, uh, X509. X509 is certificates. When you hear talking about uh, certificates, that's X509. And most of this work is uh, Roland Sh uh, Schumacher because uh, he's the uh, area expert for X509. But some of the things I, I'm most excited about are, of course, deprecation of SHA-1 and MD5 because those are not secure anymore. And we've been painfully, slowly, deprecating them. The code is still in there. You have to turn it on with a go debug. And I don't know when, when that will be gone. But hey, uh, it's painful to, uh, to move things uh, forward and, uh, that have compatibility issues and that require so many different stakeholders. There's a large company that still signs some certificates for provisioning of machines with uh, SHA-1. And I'm not naming names, but yeah. Anyway, um, a whole new path builder, a whole new certificate parser. Um, we use the platform verifiers on NECOS and Windows now for everything, which means that if a certificate works in Safari, it will work on a, a Go uh, file, uh, yeah, in a Go program uh, compiled for NECOS. And that uses some absolutely Cthulhu things in the linker to make that possible because it doesn't require uh, Seago. And I am both ashamed and proud of how that code works. It's, it just has assembly trampolines that set up the stack right and then just jump into the um, uh, dynamically linked uh, sy uh, system framework. Anyway, that, that was a fun two weeks. Uh, finally, we uh, specified that X509 targets the Web PKI. The Web PKI is the name of art for everything that, that runs uh, all the certificates that are trusted by your browser, pretty much. Uh, X509 can be used for everything from smart cards to elections, which is one of the things that makes me sleep. <laughs> particularly unease at night. I am aware of at least one country that uses Go for uh, their election software, which, hmm. <laughs> That's how Okay, no, hold on a second. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> it definitely went to sleep. It's definitely not what I was talking about. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Well, uh, the one that was underlined before it went away uh, was <coughs> the, we're and we're back. Uh, just do, 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 do. Yep. Uh -huh. set fallback routes. Uh, what, uh, what that's for is an internal API that's used by this package, which was merged. 115 minutes ago, uh, and is now available. And if you just import that package into your, uh, into your program, there's going to be embedded automatically a set of fallback routes so that if you're building a Go binary that you're just going to ship in an empty Docker container, that will work. And it will have root certificates to make TLS connections and HTTPS connections with. If you've ever tried to make a static binary and tried to deploy it, and it said, uh, oh, this certificate is not trusted, and then you had to figure out how to bring them out of Alpine or couldn't use a scratch uh, container because of that, done. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you.
again, uh, mostly R R Roland, though. Uh, <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> how that works is that it just embeds uh, a set of uh, roots, and you, if you use that, I want to see you use govon check as well, because that's how we're going to let you know if you need to update that set of roots, because updating a set of uh, roots is pretty important for security. CAs do weird stuff these days. So, to recap, the, as you can see, the goals uh, in general of the work we've been doing uh, has been to reduce complexity, because this cryptography is already an extremely complex topic in itself. The only way to get out alive of it, uh, the only way to not be continuously chasing the next vulnerability is to, in advance and over time, reduce complexity and scope down what we support and what we implement. Read, uh, testability and readability are a part of how we reduce that complexity and make all of that manageable for ourselves. Because if, if the code is readable, if the code is testable, we can get more confidence in it. And I always say that since cryptography is so complex, its code should be easier, not harder, to read. Because we are already spending so much of the complexity budget on the subject matter itself we don't have any left to be just very creative with, I don't know, three graphs or whatever in, uh, in our source. And that's also very much how Go, what Go was designed for, as you heard in the first talk today. And finally, we've been w working to keep up with the modern features of the ecosystems we uh, are part of. Uh, so as you heard, TLS, uh, TLS 1.3, and Quick. How we uh, decide how to uh, move, uh, how we decide how to pick uh, what we implement and what we don't is codified in the Go cryptography principles, which, uh, to recap, are we want the libraries to be secure, safe, practical, and modern in that order. You might notice that fast or performant is not in there. Fast is part of practical. If it's not fast enough, it's not practical because you can't use it. If it is fast enough, it's fast enough. It does, that's not a priority in, in, it, in itself. If you can use it, if it does the job for you. And we want things to be secure before that everything else and safe before everything else. So sometimes we have to say no to things. Also because um, no is temporary, yes is forever especially with the Go compatibility promise. Uh, this is a quote that Russ likes very much, but I think it's from Solomon Hikes, maybe? OK, now, very briefly, because I'm about to run over time, uh, it, future plans. In the future, we uh, are thinking about uh, maybe, maybe, I haven't actually gotten buy-in for this one, but if I can make a, a random number generator that's both cryptographically secure and fast enough for math rand, since MathRand is getting re, uh, redesigned to uh, not the, um, <clears throat> since MathRand is already getting redesigned, I'm hoping to maybe get in, in there so that one of the most common mistakes, which is using MathRand instead of CryptoRand, which, fair enough, they do sound like the same, right? <laughs> uh, that mistake would have much less uh, severe consequences. This doesn't mean you can go on the code review and say, it's fine, Filippo said that MathRand is secure now. <laughs> but it does mean that it would be uh, belts and suspenders if that happens. We are thinking about what a V2 would look like. The API has been there for the past 10 years. What would, if we had a do-over, what would we put in it? That doesn't mean we will get uh, to uh, do that. That doesn't mean we'll want to do that. But we want to think about what that would look like so that we can decide what things to bring in, what new packages to add, what, uh, what things to deprecate. Then post-quantum cryptography is coming. Uh, that's a whole field, and I'm going to be playing with Kyber, which is probably the most urgent thing to implement, because things that there's a risk that things that are encrypted now will be decrypted 20 years, 30 years, 50 years in the future when quantum computers arrive. So we need some of the things to be post-quantum now so that they can stay secure in the future. And finally, two things. Do you care about FIPS? Raise of hands. I am so sorry. That's my email. We are probably, I'm probably thinking, starting to scope out a project to get a validation for the Go cryptography that doesn't involve Sego and that doesn't involve uh, Boring Crypto. If you understood none of what I just said, good. That's just good. Keep doing what you're doing. Your life choices are correct. <laughs> <laughs> but if you did understand what I just said, send me an email, because that's the kind of project that needs funding.
Great. Uh, and speaking of funding, um, I am uh, working to get a maintainer for Xcrypto SSH as part of the uh, independent maintainer model that I'm working on. And if you care about uh, Xcrypto SSH, that's my email again because that's the kind of thing that needs funding. Uh, but in, in short, what is this model? So I'm. <clears throat> I'm trying to uh, prove that maintainers can work as professionals uh, for, an, for all the different stakeholders that care uh, about a project. And this is a bit of an experiment in open source sustainability. Uh, Google has done great for Go and is, uh, keeps doing great for Go, and Google is how I was able to work on Go for so long. Um, but I am uh, trying to find a way and show that it's possible for other projects too, to fund maintainers uh, to do uh, our job at, without relying neither on voluntarism, which doesn't work. You know the classic stereotype of uh, the XKCD with a little piece that's holding up a whole mountain and the person who's like, oh yeah, I'll get to that. Um, probably when I have time in, in, during the weekend or when they stop invading my country. That's, we keep seeing those. And you know that can be kind of funny, but really what we're doing here is a professional endeavor. And and there should be a professional way to get paid for it. And the other way, of course, is full-time employment by one company. But there are projects for which that's just not an option. Go is lucky to, uh, uh, to have Google, but that's not uh, just a universal solution for, uh, for open source. So I've written about the, this, and I am expanding it through, for example, hiring a maintainer for uh, SSH, and I'm hoping to find enough clients that are interested in that. How it works is that I sign long-term recurring contracts with, uh, with clients, and what clients get is marketing, of course, sustainability, the fact that you, know, you care about the thing and you care about it keeping being maintained, so that's what you're buying, and access. So we talk, and through the fact that we talk, we get better results both for the project and for the company. It's the kind of thing that some companies get anyway by just participating to the project. That's an option, and that's free. But it's free just in terms that headcount is free. If you, you have to get an engineer and get them to follow uh, PRs and issues and say, hey, wait, no, we use that. You can't deprecate it. Or, oh, yeah, we would like that to work like that or that. Instead, if you uh, have one of these contracts, uh, we will learn what you are working on and come to you and say, hey, we would like your feedback on this and that because uh, I think you use it and it, it might make sense. That's how the quick APIs happen, for example. The quick go uh, maintainer works for a company that has a contract and that gave me a lot of face time which allowed me to say, okay, so would this API work? Okay, no, hmm, and we just collaborated on it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, anyway, uh, th these are my clients. As I said, of course, there's a marketing angle to it, so I hope you'll f uh, forgive the uh, shameless plug. Um, and, <clears throat> fine. and basically, that's it. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And when I say subscribe, I mean to my newsletter, which is right there. There are two newsletters, one about the maintainer uh, effort, the open source main, professional open source maintainer effort, and one about cryptography, which is where I uh, post all the updates about what is coming in ne the next release and what came in the uh, last release for cryptography. So thank you very much. And if you care about FIPS, I'm sorry. That's my email. <laughs>